Thank you. Wow, so many faces. Thanks so much for being here. Wouldn't be a party without you. What a time to be you. So much to worry about, yet so much opportunity. But what will it take to really achieve sustained growth? Will it be new products, breakthrough in distribution? Will technology really make a difference? It will be different for every company. But, you know, I think it's unlikely that there'll be a silver bullet. It will mean doing a lot of things right. Sustained low interest rates have really forced companies to cut expenses. Companies need to cut cost or grow revenue. Business is really that simple. The problem? You can't keep cutting costs forever. You've done so much of that over the last decade. At some point, we really have to focus on growth. And I think growth is the imperative now. But, you know, there are so many obstacles to growth. Low interest rates, increased regulatory pressure, and this increased competition driving the need to invest in alternate bis business models and technology. Today's leaders need to be ninja warriors if they hope to achieve sustainable growth. A study by BCG found that even 2% sustained growth equated to a 40% higher shareholder value. But growing is hard. 95% of CEOs expect that revenue growth will be less than 5% in the next three years. So where should you look for growth? U.S. life insurance sales have grown, but slowly. Policy count has consistently decreased, even though the population has grown. And while we've stopped the slide in life insurance ownership, the trend has not been heading in the right direction. We need to move some of those 60 million households who say they need life insurance into buyers. But in spite of also the huge number of boomers moving to retirement, annuity sales in 2016 were 43 billion lower than in 2008. And VAs, they're off 42% since 06. And even indexed annuities that were really driving the growth. They were the growth engine. They're slowing. But think about this is occurring when the need for annuities and lifetime income has never been greater. And more Americans need that guaranteed income to have a secure retirement. What are CEOs across the world worried about? The economy and uncertain growth. So I think you're facing a conundrum. We're in this low growth, low interest rate environment. IT and compliance costs growing at alarming rates. Meanwhile, there is this need to invest and explore these new business models, as well as invest in technology to improve the customer experience, and maybe most importantly, to avoid others disrupting you. But will expense pressure cause some to underinvest in this experimentation? And will that be a problem to find that next big breakthrough that will spur that future growth? Those believe that growth is the imperative and you are investing in the future, then the big question is where to invest? Where should I make that investment? Over the last six years, there's been a really big increase in insure tech investments. Although investors are becoming a bit more discriminating and that growth slowed in 16. 
But let's not forget that banks are investing far more in technology than our life companies. And you know, there's all this buzz about digital transformation. But I think the big question is, how fast do we need to change? Now, some companies are seeing transformation as necessary across every aspect of the organization. But others are still wrestling with their strategy and how much financial to support to commit. But guess what? No matter what, all investments aren't going to pan out. In fact, many of these new ventures, they're going to likely fail. What are the reasons? Top four, undercapitalization, regulatory hurdles, failure to achieve scale, and faulty assumptions about consumer behavior. That's why you need research. Yet, if we want to grow, there's no question we got to do this, but money will be flushed down the toilet. We're going to make mistakes. How do we minimize the amount that ends up wasted? I think it starts by figuring out where will you invest? Should you invest in the day-to-day -day solutions that will improve that customer experience? that will create efficiencies in your organization, what I call practical things to improve your fundamental business model? Or should you be making investments in technology that will create that next big business model? Or do you have to actually do both? I think companies have to use a construct like this to make investments and make fundamental decisions well thought out about where you will invest. And some, where are they investing right now? The big interest in investment is in artificial intelligence. And just over the last three years, it's exploded. And I believe this is where many of you will be making big investments in the next few years. We've seen more companies leverage AI for chatbots and big data applications. In its simplest form, AI is really about embedding human intelligence into machines, enabling them to learn, to adapt, and develop solutions to problems on their own. Pretty scary. One way of thinking about it is to put them into three categories. Systems that do, systems that think, and systems that learn. Short term, many uses of AI will assist humans rather than replacing them. But some will see an incredible opportunity to change their back rooms and make them more efficient. AI can enable companies to make, take massive amounts of data from a whole array of sources and use it. The knowledge gain will help to improve that customer experience. It'll also help them increase into new markets and reach new consumers, but it will also streamline operations. Companies are beginning to find practical uses for AI, marketing, claims, customer service, and underwriting. The PNC market is already seeing big returns on AI investments. Shift Technology uses AI to examine insurance claims and identity fraud. In this case, it's analyzed more than 87 million claims. AI-powered claims management system look at photos. They look at past estimates, compare it with hundreds of thousands of records to accurately judge what should be the cost of a repair in minutes, requiring far less human intervention. Lemonade, the insurance company powered by AI, 
and behavioral economics paid a claim in three seconds with zero paperwork. AI can also help you find that next customer who is the best prospect. But more so, it can create a very personalized content that will resonate with that person. It can also analyze their response and even get that lead to a field force. And what about passwords? Don't you just hate remembering passwords? Many companies are using AI to allow clients to log in to their account using their voice. Transamerica is, so is Manulife. Reducing average handling times, but also reducing fraud. Companies are using AI to improve their service model. USAA's EVA is available on your computer or on your mobile device. EVA responds to two million, two million requests a month, allowing customers to activate credit cards, change their PIN numbers, report lost or stolen credit cards. But Eva also knows when she needs to elevate it to a human. In the Philippines, AXA launched a free wellness and personal coaching app. It not only answers questions, but it actually can start a conversation based on triggers, such as last night's sleep pattern, a change in their workout regimen. Allstate has developed Abby to answer questions about commercial lines for its 12,000 producers. Now, Nationwide launched a pilot to sell a very innovative guaranteed income product online. But you know what they found? Customers who called after hours tended to abandon the process. So they're testing bot technology to help when reps aren't available. It answers the customer's questions, but it also generates the next question based on what others have asked. The use of bots will grow, and I believe rapidly, to improve the experience of customers, but because there are economies too. In Japan, one company replaced 34 workers with Watson. The system will read medical records, very complex ones, consider the length of hospital stays, and then pay claims. Some believe many of the jobs of today will be gone. They will become obsolete, just like what happened in manufacturing. But you know, AI will also empower humans to be more efficient and help them do a better job. In areas like underwriting, in complex claims, AI will be another tool for humans to use to see patterns that they may have otherwise missed. Other apps, MedWatt, it's a virtual medical assistant it leverages deep learning to provide, in essence, a doctor in your pocket. It answers general health and medical questions, and someday may even be able to plug right into your electronic medical records to provide very specific advice. Folks, this is where we're heading. Another one is Brawly, an app that collects consumers' policies in one convenient place. But it also makes recommendations based on their current coverage. Oop, your deductible is too low. It's time to get a new quote. Consumers in another app can text their license plate to Insurify's virtual agent right through Facebook Messenger. And they can get several auto quotes to compare. 
And I'd like you to meet the first bionic insurance agent from Austin, Roberto Cyber. He actually holds a Texas license. He can greet clients, rate and issue policies on the spot, answer phone calls, and of course, make outbound robocalls. AI will not eliminate the need for advisors. Let me say that again. AI will not eliminate the need for advisors, but advisors will need to leverage technology to be more productive and free them up to spend time where they can bring the most value and differentiated value. Now, tools to help them, FinWorks. It uses behavioral finance-based questions to provide advisors with a deep understanding of how clients or prospects approach decision making and how they really react to risk. It determines what investment content maybe we should email to our clients and when to send clients a reminder to help nudge them. Provides the right message at the right time. Cetera just launched a tool to help their advisors study a client's facial expression. It picks up clues about their real attitudes toward finance and risk. Clients answer a series of questions. They view vignettes while they're sitting in front of their computer camera. The program actually maps their reaction against a very large database of human expressions. Tools like this have been used by law enforcement for years. Now they're empowering producers. Other apps will import your contacts from Google or from social media and give you personality reports on existing or prospective clients. Help producers to communicate better with clients and prospects. But none of this will just happen overnight. Our research is clear. People still want human help. Not everyone is going to trust the computer. In fact, four in 10 consumers are reluctant to use or, or absolutely refuse outright to use AI even for customer service. Research is really clear. Consumers want a mix of technology and humans. But we really need to start experimenting more. Others like Amazon really are raising the bar again. This summer, Amazon filed a patent for an augmented reality system. Using cameras and sensors, their system maps a physical room in 3D. And you would be able to act in these spaces using voice, using gesture, or even touch. Digital reality on demand. Today on Wayfair, consumers can actually see the table in the room before they buy it, uploading a picture of their room onto their site. Folks, applications like these are going to raise consumers' expectations of you. Now you might be saying, oh, but this isn't applicable to our business. Yet MetLife is having success with a virtual reality system in India. Clients can have a 3D experience with a virtual life insurance expert. It's being used with existing clients, allowing agents to be more productive, not instead of, as a supplement. To grow, we're going to have to leverage a whole lot of different technologies, a lot of different ideas, that's why I say there is no one silver bullet. 
What do we have to do? We have to gather a lot more information, pre-sale and post-sale, from our systems and outside data. And all of this has to be much more broadly available across the enterprise. We have to use this data to better engage prospective clients, as well as keeping a dialogue going with someone after they become a customer. The future is about engagement. So companies are integrating a Life IO platform onto theirs. It's purpose to engage policyholders, creating relationships with customers, frankly, in ways we haven't been good at in the past. It identifies cross-selling opportunities. It checks for life events where life insurance or savings might be needed. Who are the best new potential clients? And some of the early results are promising. Net promoter scores for insurers that use LifeIO increased 150%. Policyholders are inviting three or more friends on average to join the platform. Now, most insurers only have, believe it or not, two interactions per year with someone. That jumps to 90 interaction for those on the platform. Hanoveri has partnered with Surify to provide a platform for insurers so they can offer this to create more engagement. Munich Re has launched a health engagement platform. WellGage takes users' lifestyle signals from their apps, from their wearables, as well as contextual information about their surroundings to help them achieve their health objective. Things like preventing diabetes or reducing stress levels. It has a variety of messaging tools associated with it, but all of them with the objective of customizing the engagement. Now, there is a hope that tools like this, we can even have a more noble purpose, that we can get people to better monitor themselves, maybe even change their behavior, helping them live longer. Everyone wins. Health IQ is a website that engages health conscious affinity groups. Runners, weightlifters, cyclists, vegetarians, vegans. There are over 1.5 million who have taken health IQ quizzes. Swiss Re's research has correlated improved mortality for those that live a healthy lifestyle. Now, what they've done is partnered with a number of carriers to launch on Health IQ, offering lower priced life insurance to health conscious consumers. Now, when someone takes one of those quizzes, they provide a great deal of underwriting info. Some will receive a text offering them a preferred rate on life insurance from Health IQ. If the consumer says they're interested, they are going to get a call within 30 seconds. There are people in call centers ready to respond instantly. Swiss Re is also working with RealAge. This is a site created by Dr. Oz, and he promotes this regularly on his TV show. Consumers are encouraged to play a game that will ascertain their real age. Sounds a little like Vitality with John Hancock. But you know what? 41 million people have engaged with this test. While Amazon collects your retail profile, this site wants to build your healthcare profile and be your go-to place for medical info. Users are sent information on new medical treatments 
or other relevant things based on their answers in particular medical conditions. Partners will also be able to create very specific marketing messages, targeting those people based on their needs to offer life insurance. In both of these examples, insurers can target very specific people and send very targeted messages based on their self-reported health data. I believe this kind of digital engagement is really the next phase of affinity marketing. Approaches that engage people who are not necessarily thinking about buying life insurance or saving more money for retirement. Policy Genius just announced a partnership with LendingTree, the nation's number one online mo loan market. People looking for mortgages will be able to buy term life to cover their mortgage. Sounds like a return to the past. New models that are not disintermediating companies, but making life insurance more available when people have a higher propensity to buy. Protective is partnered with Sofi, Sofi, the student loan giant, to reach young customers. Pan America really recently acquired Hola Doctors. Their consumer-directed website has an audience of 2.5 million monthly visitors. Now this is a trusted destination for health and lifestyle content in Spanish, giving Pan American an entree into more homes. There's also a new app called Tomorrow. It lets you create wills and trusts online for free. You answer a series of questions, and based on your input, documents are created. There are tools, videos, things providing you step-by-step -step instructions. But it's also built to be social, too. So you can bring others like your spouse, your siblings, and even friends into the estate planning process. The data supplied is then used to calculate how much life insurance you need. Then it refers them to their own site, where there are nine carriers on the platform offering simplified terms. These are the kinds of relationships that you will need to reach the underinsured and the undersaved. Limmer Research finds that there are 19 million stuck shoppers, people who started but never bought. We need to convert more of these people to buyers. That's why so many of you are focusing on how to expedite the underwriting process. Seven in 10 Americans say they would buy a simplified life policy. One quarter of the underinsured or uninsured say they would buy if it were easier. And we're seeing companies respond. They're offering larger term policies completely through automated underwriting. Haven Life uses AI to learn from Mass Mutual's historic data, hundreds of thousands of fully underwritten cases to build algorithms to issue faster. Quilt tells consumers they can get a million dollars in 15 minutes. Ladder Life offers as much as 8 million of term coverage online. Almost every carrier in this room has an initiative underway to provide more simplified issue or cut your underwriting time dramatically. But speed alone won't grow the market. 60% of Ladder's applications 
are written after hours. How many of you are prepared to take a nap at three in the morning? But don't kid yourself, these models still have challenges too. Technology alone is not going to get people to buy more. Many people at some point still want to talk to a human. But while we're trying to get faster ways of underwriting with less invasive tests, there is increased risk to the industry of adverse selection. The proliferation of affordable genetic testing could have a tremendous impact on our business. The FDA has approved the first in-home DNA tests. 23andMe is marketing gene tests for 10 diseases. These tests provide information on people's individual ge genetic predisposition. What are they likely to get in the future? But let me ask you, will they tell you what they find out? What are the implications to underwriting and to mortality? Then there's the opioid epidemic. The victims are our neighbors, our friends, and coworkers. Could these new challenges affect future mortality? On the other side of the coin, there is more data than ever to allow you to make good decisions faster. But will you be able to use it? Regulators are looking at broader pricing issues and questioning what data carriers are relying on to make underwriting decisions. <clears throat> when I make presentation to regulators, I tell them our research is clear. If we're going to get more people the coverage they need, if we're going to avoid putting a bigger strain on the social safety net, we have to make it easier. We have to make it simpler. Now, we're also seeing companies find new ways to access medical records more quickly. USAA has created the capability to access the Veterans Affairs patient portal with an applicant's permission. And they've been able to reduce the time it takes to get records by 30 days. Now, beware. Recently, it was reported that Amazon has a secret team called 1492. A lot of different projects, but it's believed that they're working on electronic medical records. And Bloomberg just reported that Amazon is going to enter the prescription drug market. Imagine the implication if you're CVS and Walgreen, given how much Amazon knows about their customers. So I have a question. Is Amazon working to position itself as the center of health records? In the future, could Amazon tell you who the best prospects are for life insurance, or will they become the competition? Could they be the disruptor? Now, technology can help companies provide a better customer experience. We talked about that. Can help you run your business more efficiently, and as I hope I've demonstrated, even help you reach underserved populations might even help us develop better habits for them and help them live longer. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So maybe, just maybe, there is a new path to growth, one that is intrinsically partnered with technology. We will need to continuously experiment, adding capabilities to improve our fundamental business models. We do need to test new ideas and technology to help us keep moving forward, but to risk being left behind. 
I believe this experimentation will lead to incremental change, but it will also prepare us for the big breakthrough. It will allow us not to fall so far behind, so it will improve our odds of not being disrupted by an external force. Now, a few years ago, you know, it was social media. We were talking about mobile devices. Those things are all table stakes. Currently trending, big data, predictive analytics, AI. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? That's why I say there really is no one silver bullet, but technology will play a major role. The reality, you know it, the world is moving fast, Change is absolutely the only thing you can count on besides death and taxes. Those who embrace change and evolving technologies, I believe, will be better positioned for the future. Thank you.